All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So we'll turn it over to Major Alston. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Major Alston. I am the Senior Associate Vice President for Development. And thank you for joining us for our second installment of the Ohio Sense of Place series. Today, our panelists will uh, be focusing on the student experience and what the fall semester might look like. From our online viewers, we would like you to consider your undergraduate experience and how meaningful it was in your life. We know our students will experience something vastly different, but it is our goal to ensure we continue to provide a safe, positive, and engaging and learning environment nonetheless. I would like to express my gratitude for our panelists who are joining us today. Dr. Jenny Hall-Jones, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Julie Cromer, Athletic Director, Dr. Marlene De La Cruz Guzman, Director of the Multi, uh, Office of Multicultural Student Access and Retention, also known as OMSAR, and Chase McCorkle, a rising junior in the College of Business and a member of the Presidential Leadership Society. I would also like to thank Kelsey Rock, Rogers, Assistant Director of Donor Engagement, who will serve as our moderator today. Please know that you should feel encouraged to post questions in the chat feature, and we will monitor that throughout the evening. Kelsey, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Major, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. We hope that you really enjoy this. We're excited to talk with all of you. Um, a little housekeeping thing to start off with, when you're posting in your chat box, you should see a drop down that says to everyone or to specific people. So if you're sharing or if you have questions, feel free to click on everyone so that we can all see your questions and memories and things like that as we go through our conversation today. So to start out with, I'd love to hear from our viewing audience. As you all know, we are getting ready for our students to start fall semester. So we were just talking about how things are a little different right now. Um, and we wanted to know what some of your memories are. So if you can post in the chat some of your move-in experiences or some of your favorite memories from your first few weeks on campus if you're an alum, and maybe if you didn't go to Ohio University, what was your first impression the first time that you were on campus? And and then we'll revisit some of those memories after we've covered a few questions with our panelists. So feel free to think about that and chime in whenever you feel like it. So I'm going to kick things off with our first question to Jenny. So Jenny, we'd love for you to talk a little bit about what the big picture looks like from your perspective right now in terms of planning for the fall semester, um, what it went into getting us to this point, and then what's the fall semester going to look like for our students? That's a lot. And I'm going to try not to take the entire time that we have, but I appreciate uh, kind of starting with that because I think probably that's what y'all are most curious about. Um, and I don't know how many times we've said the word unprecedented in the last like six months or so, but I would say our class of 2020 that didn't get to walk at least walk graduation, walk commencement, at least they kind of have a shared experience with our class of 1970 who also did not get to walk in their commencement. And we are trying to make those connections with those two classes. But for this fall, I don't even know. We'd have to like look at our, our, our archives for World War I and then in the 19 teens to find out what did Ohio University look like the last time we went through a pandemic. Right. Um, but I don't think anybody remembers that and we can't really compare it. Um, you might be noticing all across uh, the nation right now, schools that tried to open in person are now closing, if you're paying any attention to what's going on in the news. What we tried to do at Ohio University is start conservatively, we're going to start slow. So we are doing a phased in approach to see what we can handle, to see uh, how good we are at following recommendations, um, and then slowly bring back and build more and more students onto our campus experience. So what we did is right now we've kind of got two phases. So right now we have about 30, 300 students that ha are moving into the residence halls this weekend. Um, in case you can't remember how big our residential system is, it, we can house around 7,000 students. So it is definitely a small fraction of undergraduates who are moving on campus. Uh, we are going to have about 1,500 to 2,000 students who have been released to be on campus for on-campus classes, for labs, and these are students because of accreditation in their majors and in their programs and departments that have to be on campus. So it's students like our junior and senior nursing students, it's our aviation uh, students, and then other students who need and have to have that um, hands-on classroom experience. So it's very small. Phase two, uh, we are going to announce, we're still working on it, 
but we are going to announce phase two by September 8th. Um, and we're hoping we're going to bring back more students in late September. I think our date's like September 28th or 27th. Um, and what we've asked is all of our academic leadership to let us know what is the next wave? Like, what is the next set of students who really need to be in those labs and need to have that kind of on-campus experience? Um, and the hope is that if everything goes really well, we can make it through the semester. And what we'll try to do is continue to try to densify campus because we started off in a de-densifying wor world, which is another word that we've been saying a lot lately um, on campus. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. We are obviously keeping close track and close partnership with our health department um, and our local health leaders. We have appointed a specialist, Dr. Gillian Ice, who is a special assistant to the president right now for public health operations. Um, and we are just working through this kind of new normal that we find ourselves in. Now you might be thinking because Kelsey asked you to reflect on your experiences when you moved in. Um, one of the things that we love having an undergraduate experience, especially on the Athens campus, is that sense of place. And people were very worried that this new first year class were coming to Athens. Now our regional campuses are still gonna be attending classes in person, uh, but the Athens campus are really worried that they're not gonna feel that connection to us and that sense of place. So we're doing a bunch of things. I'm just gonna highlight a couple. Um, all RAs have still been offered jobs. So we have RAs who are living at home in their hometowns, for me, Kingsville, Ohio, um, that, would, that basically are engaging with what would have been their floor section virtually. So the RAs are still reaching out to those first year students and those sophomores and they are building programming and doing things to connect them. And our learning communities. Our learning communities are cohorts of first year students that take classes together. Uh, and then their instructors and their peer leaders, their learning community leaders, are also doing amazing work reaching out and connecting and trying to build that same sense of place and that sense of community as if we were literally on campus. Um, so that, oh, and I also wanna let you know in my notes that all of the really wonderful things that we normally would do in person, like welcome week, like the involvement fair, like homecoming. Um, we are doing all of these things virtually. So there, we're not gonna be having any of these big in-person events this fall, but we've got a really creative team and staff and students who wanna be engaged because they're hungry for that engagement because they want to be out of their parents' houses um, that are gonna be doing all of these engagement activities with us. Chase is laughing because he knows he was happy to be <laughs> moving in. So I think I'm gonna stop with that because I know you'll probably have other questions for me in the chat. Did, did I hit everything for you, Kelsey? Yes, thank you so much. That was fantastic. It's so exciting to hear about all the different ways that the students are still going to get to engage um, having heard a little bit about how we're bringing students back to campus, I know that some people have had lots of those questions about how we're going to create that, that feel of even if it's a regional campus, the Athens campus, how are we going to give them the opportunity to still engage with one another, engage with us. So thank you for covering all of that. I'm sure we will have more questions for you. All right, for the rest of our panelists, I wanna ask you all the same question, and I think we'll probably start with Julie. Um, I wanna ask you what your goals are for the students as they begin classes and activities in this coming week. Some of them obviously, as Jenny mentioned, in person and some virtually. So what are your goals for students as they get started? And we'll start with Julie and then we'll go on to Marlene as well. Well, Kelsey, I appreciate the question and the opportunity to join the panel tonight. But I have to go back, um, Jenny, to your comments. We were joking before we got started about dealing with a student who wants to come back. And I think your point at the end about how our students are ready to stop dealing with some of their parents at home, I think it, it goes both ways. So that's my shout out to my friend, Dan Butterly. And I look forward to meeting your daughter when, when she can come back to Athens. I, I think our goals, Kelsey, are the same as they are for um, all students. It's, you know, we need to spend this semester learning and growing and developing um, and, you know, connecting and staying engaged to Jenny's comments and preparing to be ready for what comes after the pandemic. I think for our students um, across the board, whether they are athletes or not, we are all learning new ways of using technology in our lives. 
We're preparing for a different economy on the backside of the pandemic. They will be searching for their next roles in life in a very different way than they would have been 12 to 18 months ago if they were entering um, post, you know, post-collegiate life. And so we're all using this time in our own way with our own interests and in our own activities to continue learning and developing and being engaged in you know, the wonderful OU community. And we keep talking to our student athletes about preparing to be ready, preparing and being ready for when, in our case, we do have an opportunity to get back to games and competition, um, but just also to be ready for what comes next in life. There's great value to this time for all of us. And you know, so we keep focusing on being ready. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Marlene, can you talk to us from your perspective? What are your goals for students as they come back? Sure. In some ways, as Julie said, it really is a similar goal set that we have regularly, right? We want to continue the wraparound academic support that we provide every day when we're on campus, except we're doing it in a different modality. But we want to make sure that that wraparound part stays. We will also want to take advantage of new ways to think about serving scholars and upping our game because we have the opportunity to do it and to re-envision. And we always have to keep the student at the center of what we do. So we want to make sure that as we provide these services and new modalities, that we continue to be student-centered. So those are our goals. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I love that everyone's already talking about how we are so student-centered. Um, speaking of students, let's bring Chase into the conversation. Um, so Chase, thanks so much for joining us. We love having a student perspective. Um, as Jenny mentioned, this is absolutely an unprecedented time. Um, so as you look at coming back to campus, tell us a little bit about what your goals are for yourself in this online environment, and then maybe potentially in this phased-in approach. Yeah, I'd like to start off by saying thank you all for having me. Um, it's really great seeing all of your faces again, even if it's just online. Um, my biggest goal for this semester is probably just to stay grounded. Um, with everything going on, uh, everything being online, it's really easy to sort of feel disconnected from everyone and everything. So for me, it's just starting off with those little things, uh, waking up early, I make my bed, I try to read, journal, uh, work out, eat breakfast. Uh, so just starting off my day with those little things and then stemming from that, just making sure that I stay on top of my work and still manage to find ways to have fun while staying safe on campus. Great. <laughs> and that's And did you, Chase, when you think about staying connected and kind of staying in your routine, um, Jenny gave us lots of options of things that they're doing to support our students and help them connect. What are some ways that you have thought about trying to make sure that you connect with friends and faculty and staff and still get that Ohio experience? Yeah, uh, I definitely still like to take advantage of all the opportunities online that I get to interact with faculty. Um, I just had a phone call with my advisor yesterday, Ms. Beatrice. She, she says hi to everyone, by the way. Um, so making sure that I take advantage of all of those meetings with, with faculty and then with friends, um, just trying to figure out new ways to sort of have fun. Uh, we go outside and play catch or just go for walks and, and enjoy just being outside for a little bit. Um, so just getting away from these four walls <laughs> sometimes. Um, but yeah, just making sure that we stay safe while we're doing everything that we're doing and just still manage to have fun and see each other. Great. We, we love some social distance walking. That is, that's a great activity. <laughs> All right, let's switch gears a little bit here. And my next question is for Julie. So Julie, this is the first time since the inception of the Mid-American Conference in 1946 that our student athletes won't be competing in fall sports. So how are the students coping with this decision? And then also, what plans do you and your staff have to help keep them focused and conditioned in this kind of different world for them? Well, I appreciate the question. They are incredibly resilient. Um, maybe more so than their coaches and athletic director. They have bounced back from uh, that decision fairly quickly with a, you know, with a pretty sharp focus. And I think they are incredibly well informed. They get information from a lot of sources, just like, you know, a lot of other college students. And so they have been tracking developments throughout the summer and they were preparing for whatever 
came their way. And so in some ways to have a sense of what that decision was, gave them the opportunity to shift gears and, and maybe narrow their focus and prepare for uh, the option that moves our games and our meets and our competitions to the spring, but doesn't change the fact that they train year round and they prepare year round. So one of the things I think is easy for us to do as fans is to think about college sports in the context of Saturdays or, you know, maybe a random weeknight event. We think about them in the form of entertainment that we all love and enjoy in the community building around the events. And our student athletes, when they're in their four or five years here with us, they're in ongoing training and development that is actually a lot more like their intellectual development. So I think just like none of us would summarize the entire value of a semester based only on the exam days, um, especially in um, large classes that at least back in my day a long time ago might have only involved a midterm and a final. You know, there's a lot of learning that happens in between those evaluations. And for us, the games are a lot like exam days. And so in the days in between, we're learning you know, where our film study is like lecture, our skill development or like group projects, our practice sessions or like um, drafts that we might be doing of papers and projects that we're taking reads through and preparing to be evaluated. And we'll continue to do that throughout the fall, even with the sports who don't have an opportunity to have those games and meets and competitions until the spring. And then, you know, we have winter and spring sports as well. And the, right now the winter sports are um, on as scheduled to begin around the November time period. We have, a, I think, some, some more work to do in preparation for that at the conference and national level. And so much like Jenny said, you know, we're ramping up slowly. We'll see how that goes. And probably there will be some decisions made around those sports, you know, as well. But uh, our student athletes have been very resilient and they're ready um, for whatever comes to them and the opportunity to get better this semester. Thank you. Yeah, I think resilience is definitely the word for Ohio University. It, as we've faced all of these challenges and all these different worlds, it's, it's really great to see that the faculty and staff are looking for ways to support the students and minimize the impact on their experience as much as possible. And I'm so glad to hear that our student athletes are doing well as well. All right, so we're gonna move on to Marlene. Marlene, I wanna to talk to you a little bit too about resilience. Um, when we think about our multicultural student populations, what um, is the impact of distance learning or the virtual experience on our multicultural student populations? And what are some mechanisms that we have in place to keep them connected as well? Yeah, so um, I think as it affects all students, so underrepresented students are affected by this. In addition to that, we know that COVID-19 is striking um, a little bit harder, right, on populations of underrepresented folks. And so in addition to the historical happenings, this is a hard time. Um, the way we see it is serving diverse students is always a priority at Ohio University. And so we're working particularly hard to make sure that we provide the same wraparound support virtually that we do in person. So all of diversity and inclusion and all stars programs and advising are now online, but we are keeping that sense of place with our programs and staff interactions, and we're doing it in specific ways. So Lynx has been going for, this is the 36th year, right? Um, we are continuing that. We have peer mentors meeting much like those RAs that Jenny mentioned, uh, regularly with students planning group gatherings virtually, having biweekly meetings, checking in to see how they're doing. Uh, we also have student success advising by our staff which happens regularly. We're still connecting them to tutoring, to personal and professional workshop opportunities. And we also continue to monitor, monitor their scholarship compliance because that's a key part of the program. In addition to that sort of more technical bit, we also have quite a bit of programming happening. And we've moved that online as well. I'm going to drop um, the link to one of the pages that we use, which is the Commit um, to Care 
program and you will see there quite a bit of programming that we've put on. So that website sort of centralizes it for our students to easily access that and it's available to all students. In addition to that, we've created transition programs. We had the first one last night quite successfully. Quite a few students came, asked questions, wanted to know about campus life, about how to thrive at Ohio University. Um, we also have a new program, which is uh, called OMEN, Ohio Male Empowerment Network. And it's geared towards underrepresented students at Ohio University. Everyone's welcome. But the goal is to make sure that we're meeting those needs. It, we also have Being Black in College, which is an ongoing series, and a Commuter and Appalachian Network programming series. And that's not even mentioning everything that we have going on with our partners within diversity and inclusion. So the Women's Center, the LGBT Center, the Multicultural Center, they're all conducting online programming. In some ways, it's business as usual. The business just looks a little different because we're doing it in this modality, but we're also really excited about what we're able to do. And we're committed to making sure that underrepresented students and really all students are well supported so that they can succeed academically. So as a fellow alumni, I think we're doing a good job. And let me say, go Bobcat. Thank you so much. Uh, we actually just got a question from Joan Silver about how COVID-19 is affecting international students. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Um, and Jenny, if you want to jump in as well, if anyone wants to give us a little bit of kind of understanding of that and then what we're also doing to support our international students. Um, we work with some international students, but Jenny will have way more on this. I know that we created a fund to which, you know, I'm sure many of the folks on this um, call have in fact contributed uh, because we want to make sure that they're okay. Some of them got stranded, some of them are working through some things. So Jenny, I'll defer to you. I would say that our international students are being impacted disproportionately um, in a negative way. So many couldn't even come back to campus. So our enrollment for our international students is down because of borders being closed. Um, and because of federal regulations, our international students are only allowed to work on campus. And so many of them lost those jobs. So when we closed, uh, we kept people employed through the rest of the semester, like the spring semester, uh, but we were not able to employ people through the summer. And a lot of our international folks, you know, work in culinary and they work in food service. And if we're not serving food uh, to students, then they don't have jobs. And so unfortunately, um, they were very negatively impacted. And so our fundraising that was great, so our COVID fund that we raised over $250,000 for, uh, my office and the Dean of Students Office, Kathy Fall, who's our Assistant uh, Dean for Basic Needs, helped coordinate with the President's Office, with majors uh, folks, um, to make sure that we were distributing that money appropriately. And right around half went to international students. Uh, we also have the majority of our international students this summer, we were feeding through the food pantry. So we were doing kind of an, an appointment, uh, food pantry by appointment this summer. And we fed a little over 100 students a month. They were able to come twice a month to the food pantry. And we, um, they all got cold bags of like milk and eggs and cheese. And we bought a lot of produce and very fresh things, things that we wouldn't normally have in our pantry because we used our donor funds, our money that people have donated to the food pantry, as to spend about $800 a week to buy things like the fresh produce and the cold goods in order to uh, give to our students. And like I said, most of those students this summer were international students. Um, so we're continuing to provide that support because if you're thinking about fall and the fact that we don't quite have as many services, we still are not employing that many students. And so that food pantry support is uh, really important. And then also our emergency micro grants uh, for our international students. But for instance, our, we are housing international students right now, the folks that were able to come to campus, there were undergrads and we only had 10. And we usually would have way more than that um, living in our residence halls. So good question, uh, Joan, but we're continuing to do everything we can to support our international students. Wow, thank you so much for that. I didn't realize that about half of that money that was funded through the um, Bobcats Take Care campaign had gone to international students. That's fantastic that we have the opportunity to support those students in that way as well. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, we're running a little on time, so I do want to ask Chase a couple more questions. But also, if any of our attendees have any more questions, please feel free to drop those in the chat, and we will come back to those right after we talk with Chase a little bit. 
So Chase, you are a current student from Pittsburgh, I believe, um, and you are entering your junior year. So can you describe to us a little bit about your experience in the spring semester, what you learned through that challenging transition and to a totally virtual experience and how you're preparing for the fall? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, going into the spring semester, it almost sort of felt like I was a freshman all over again. Uh, the biggest things that I had to learn, and very quickly, might I add, as a freshman, were uh, about like accountability, time management, and organization. And in the spring semester, when everything went online, I feel like all of those skills had to become amplified. Um, first, you had to hold yourself accountable just for getting up, going to class. Now you have to make sure that you're on the call, you're attentive, you're focused, you're interacting when you're like on your couch or as me, you're in a bouncing spinning chair and you're five, you're five feet away from your TV with your phone in your hand, you have all these distractions. So just making sure that I held myself accountable and staying and interactive in my classes. Um, and then with time management, first, when you first get into college, obviously you have a lot more free time on your hands. And then when everything went to online, it's like, wow, you have uh, so much free time on your hands uh, because some of the classes don't meet as often. So you really have to focus on managing your time, uh, making sure that you get everything done because me, myself, I'm, I'm more of a crunch time person. Um, my best time is crunch time. So then whenever I have a lot of time on my hands, it's really easy for me to fall into the habit of, oh, I have time to do this. So I have time to do this. And then it's like, oh, oh, this is due. So um, just making sure that I, I managed my time well and I stayed focused and I, I made sure to get all the tasks done that were at hand. And then just staying organized. Um, it was really easy to sort of fall into a sort of drowsiness uh, because every day kind of felt like it was the same day. It was really difficult to keep track of everything. So I really had to buckle down and get organized, focus on my calendar, write everything down, uh, make sure that I made all of my classes, attended all of my meetings and got everything done on time. So I feel like those are the biggest things that I didn't learn from uh, the virtual thing, but it sort of amplified them. And so going into this semester, uh, I plan on doing those same things. And then, like I said a little bit earlier, um, making sure that I keep myself grounded uh, is my, my biggest challenge for this semester and my biggest goal for this semester. But we, we have a lot of people here supporting me. So I thank you guys and I look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Chase. I got to tell you, procrastination was my number one skill in college. Um, I did grow out of that junior and senior year. I learned time management way better. But yes, that was definitely something I experienced in, in not even an online world. <laughs> so I hear you there. Um, I want to ask you another question, Chase. I think this is an interesting dynamic in terms of your family. So as a student, what is it like for your parents um, or family members as you get ready to go back to school? Are they nervous about your return, either from a health and safety standpoint and learning what all Ohio University is doing to prepare you and make sure that everything's safe? Or from the virtual environment, are they, are they nervous about those same things, procrastination and um, working through the virtual world? Yeah, that is another great question. Um, they are a little bit nervous. I'm sure many people are during these times just because of everything that's going on. Um, however, uh, the theme of earlier, they were done dealing with me um, and I was done dealing with them. Uh, so they were, they were happy to let me go. And they also understood that throughout this summer, they, I lived with them. I, I practiced social distancing. I wore my mask. I washed my hands all the time. Uh, so they know that I'm here, that they know that I'm doing the right things. And they also had the chance to meet some of the faculty and staff at Ohio University over my past two years here. Uh, they've met Dr. Marlene. So they know everything that she's doing. And as you guys heard earlier, she's doing a lot. Um, and so they know that I'm in good hands and they trust the university and they trust me. So that sort of makes them a little bit more comfortable with me being three hours away at school. And they also trust that I, I'll, I'll keep up my studies and keep working hard. Um, and they know that, like Dr. Marlene said, we still have those scholarship requirements. So I know she'll be making sure that I get everything done as well. <laughs> so they know I have a great support system here and they trust in me. And so they're a little bit more comfortable with it. Marlene, I saw you nodding your head there. You're, <laughs> you'll be right there with him, huh? 
<laughs> he's pretty wonderful. So we don't have to do that much, but we're right here for him. So great. Thank you. Um, I believe that we have another question. Um, I think John is sort of answering it for us, but Jenny um, or anyone, do you all want to talk a little bit about if you know anything about how grading has changed during the spring semester when we went virtual? I am not an academic person, so I'm going to throw that to Chase. What did you do in the spring, Chase? <laughs> um, I believe in the spring semester, I know some classes, uh, you had the option to pass fail it but I don't know which classes were exempt from it. I don't think any of mine were exempt. However, if you, if your grade would benefit your GPA, then you had the option to keep that grade and accept the grade. But if it wouldn't benefit your GPA, then you had the option to just have a passing grade for it and just receive that um, pass on your, um, on your DARS, I guess. And then it didn't go towards your GPA, but the credits still counted. It kind of sounds like to me that you had such good grades, you just took all your grades. I did. That's what I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Great. Great job, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> So um, it, it sounds like the main way that it changed was that you could either keep your letter grade um, or opt to take a satisfactory or a pass fail type of score um, for your final grade. But we can actually do a little more research into that and talk with our academic friends and find out some more information to, um, to answer that question a little better for you, Joan. Um, and we have, if, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, and it was a very valuable thing for those who experienced great hardship in the spring. So for students who really, really struggled because of the change, because of mental health, because of family affected by COVID or selves affected by COVID, this was a tremendous opportunity for them to continue to make progress to be able to graduate. And the university uh, was very kind in making that accommodation and taking students' um, situations into consideration. So it was a wonderful thing. That's such a great point. As, as we were all sort of living this in the spring semester, initially we thought we were just extending spring break as all universities did. And then things kind of got out of hand with COVID. So I, I think that's a really good point that Ohio University was able to adapt really quickly in terms of finding ways to support the students who may have felt sort of out of sorts and may have been having more challenges than others at that time. So yes, um, thank you for that question. That was fantastic. Uh, we are running a little low on time, so we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. But if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reply to your registration email and we can do some research and get you some answers as well. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Major Alston for a little bit of a closing. And I just want to thank you all for taking the time to spend with us this evening. All right. Thanks, Kelsey. And a special thanks to our panelists for taking uh, time to speak with us uh, during an undoubtedly busy time as students uh, begin their return to Athens. Uh, thanks to our online viewers as well for joining us. Uh, as you heard today, our university leaders are working tirelessly to help our students succeed this fall. And uh, some students uh, will still experience challenges, we know that. Um, there are ways that um, you can help our students as they navigate uh, the next few months. Should students experience financial hardship, they can apply for student emergency grants uh, to help with unforeseen uh, expenses. The, we will uh, post a, a website, actually a link uh, in the chat uh, for the Student Emergency Fund uh, for your consideration and certainly uh, learn a little bit more uh, about uh, that particular fund. Um, we hope that you guys stay safe, uh, wear your mask, stay well, and certainly look forward to seeing you all again here on campus uh, here real soon. Hopefully. Have a great weekend.